So, yeah, um, our presentation is entitled Coffee Second Act, the Fungi Connection. So it's kind of similar to Ashling's. It's we're in the same space anyway, the same domain, which was food waste. Um, so on the image on the left, you can see some coffee grounds in the base, some oyster mushrooms on the top, and actually I'll use the L pointer. And um, then some of our Revolution Ragu, which was the product we produced. So a little bit more context. So yeah, since 2017, Ireland is importing over 100,000 uh, tons of coffee per year. And it's transported great distances um, and then just really used uh, once and thrown in the bin. Uh, so we often found that this was a uh, black bin or destined for landfill and sometimes brown bin, but we felt that it was um, a, waste, a wasteful use of resources. Um, and Paddy had done some research and found uh, other examples of people growing oyster mushrooms from coffee grains uh, spend coffee grounds. So that's what we did. We set up in 2020 a business with the idea of, uh, as you can see in the graphic on the left, uh, collecting coffee grounds from cafes and uh, then using them to grow oyster mushrooms that we would hopefully serve back into the cafe, uh, creating that kind of um, circular economy you can see. Um, so the EPA funded us to do three different work packages. Work package one was basically logging all farm inputs and outputs. Work package two was um, composting tests, tests of spent mushroom substrate. So after we've grown the mushrooms in the coffee grounds, uh, what, what, like what kind of compost could we could produce then uh, as an end product, let's say. And then work package three was looking at alternative waste streams, mainly it actually just ultimately was totally focused on um, cardboard. Uh, could this be used as another urban waste stream that we could grow mushrooms on? So I guess, uh, yeah, before we start, it's probably, uh, a bit a good to get an overview of the the mushroom farming process so our first stage is the, is the mix if we look at uh, the graphic in the bottom actually with the three buckets in a row the far left is where we we get our coffee grounds we use wood shavings and water and then we get some spawn or mycelium um so it's some mushroom seed let's say uh do the mix mix it together in the bucket then for the second stage we take that bucket and we uh, put it in incubation so this is where we literally just keep it in a warm dark place uh, for approximately three weeks so yeah around 20 degrees celsius is determined optimum but there's a, a lot of um, variability that you can that, that, that is available uh, you know it's fairly fairly robust process and uh, preferably with high concentrations of co2 so your outdoor air is about 450 500 parts per million you're looking at for hopefully about greater than 800 parts per million for incubation to be uh, successful or at least rapid um so then fruiting so in the third bucket so that's our white in the in the center image we can see our our fully colonized our uh, bucket so at this point the mycelium spawn has as 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 has run through the entire substrate and turned it white uh, and it's at this point that you then shift it to the third stage which is called fruiting so here we're trying to replicate a, an autumnal storm uh, so lots of fresh air and humidity so you drop the co2 levels to yeah your 400 outdoor out, similar to outdoor around four or five hundred and uh, ramp up the humidity to 90 percent in and there around so in the image on the right we can see our first uh, top right we can see our first setup so our first incubation room is just they're just ikea boxes with um incubating in a hot press and then this up the top our first fruiting room is just a tent draped over i don't know i forget but it was very uh very basic. Uh, and then we moved on to the, the bottom. We can see our incubation tents. So these were the hydroponic grow tents uh, that we just put shelving in and uh, humidifiers. So our incubation on the left with a, with a small uh, uh, teeter. And then on the right, we have uh, some blue lights, which we at the time we had we had heard were, were, were preferable for mushroom fruiting. fruiting. So we needed we knew we needed to scale and uh, you know to actually satisfy the, the work uh, packages elements as well of logging farm inputs and outputs we wanted to design a farm where we could introduce sensors and have uh, various rooms for the various stages of the motion process so we purchased this um uh, 45 foot uh, reefer trailer so it's a ex refrigerated unit which we knew would come in handy because it's well insulated uh, and if we see on the bottom left there's our initial design so we would add this mixing room extension because we reckoned we even needed more space uh, to, to an area for mixing. Then we'd have our incubation room uh, in between is a, a, an area called the antechamber, which is where it's kind of like an uh, environmental control center. 
Um, so all your electronics and your sensors kind of lo located there. We have an AC unit in there that heats the air within that chamber. And then when the temperature needs to be adjusted, either incubation or fruiting, you then pipe air, um, you know, again, based on thresholds defined by sensors into either incubation or fruiting to adjust the, the environment in those rooms. So, yeah, so after, yeah, guts of a year, uh, we converted that reefer trailer into what you see here. Um, so our front of this, and it was moved up to UCD. So that was great. One of the uh, professors in UCD uh, purchased the ragu and really liked it, really liked the story and wanted to then see if it could be brought to UCD. So fortunately that all happened. And um, yeah, we got some artwork to make it try and look nice. Uh, and if we look in the bottom image on the, on, on the back of house, you can see that uh, we have this large 750 liter um, rainwater collection tank. So we're, we're kind of getting to the farm inputs and outputs, but it, we were looking at electrical usage, uh, water usage, um, and yeah, all those kind of, I guess, similar to, to Ashling, like logging the, the coffee we were using and uh, the output of the, the, the mushrooms uh, that we were producing. So yeah, on this image on the right, we can just see our mixing room with two simple um, cement mixers that we'd use to do our mixes. And on, on, on the far right, we can see, uh, yeah, just, so here we have our, our antechamber with the AC unit uh, permanently keeping the air in the antechamber around 20 degrees Celsius. And then periodically um, this filter, this fan here would, would drive air into the fruiting room. Let's say you can see the, just about maybe see the pipe at the top where the air would come into the room and, and, and fall from the top. And the CO2 laden air, which is heavier, would be forced down to the bottom and be exhausted via uh, flap vents at the base of the, the room. So, yeah, actually a huge part of the project was really growing vessel experimentation. So um, on the left, the, the, the column bag, the plastic bag you, you can see there, that's really the most common uh, small scale mushroom farm um, uh, vessel. And it's one we started with, and it's it it is it it's, it works and it's um you know effective and it's it's easily to manage, but uh, it is a single use plastic which was a problem for us, and um, so <clears throat> I, we 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 switched over to ten liter buckets, which we were we're going great, and actually the transparent nature of them really allowed you to see the 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 process how well the 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 batch was incubating and if there was any issues with 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 con contamination. So your biggest problem as a mushroom farmer is contamination with, with trichoderma or green mold. Um, and yeah, with the clear nature of the transparent bucket or the column bag, you can actually see if green mold is affecting that particular bucket and maybe remove it. But the problem, okay, with the problem with the column bags is that you're really limited to about eight liters or there, maybe it's 10, I forget exactly. Um, but yeah, so you're, there's a lot of individual preparation of the bag, moving it into incubation, moving it into fruiting. Uh, and harvesting smaller individual batches. So it was just kind of, um, it was it was inefficient labor-wise. So we ran a trial of, if you can see the Mark 1, 220 liter barrel, that was just, a, uh, we had seen a, a composting co a setup. Um, what is it called again? I forget exactly. Anyway, uh, anyway, um, the idea was that we'd, we'd take the blue barrel and stick a pipe in the center. So you can imagine with these column bags, they're limited to 16 centimeter diameter because you have to be able to have air penetrate all the way into the center of the bag uh, to allow that inoculation to take place. So if you have too wide a bag, the air isn't able to penetrate in the center and it'll never inoculate in there. Uh, so by pick, sticking this pipe in the center, we were able to facilitate air exchange from the inside out and the outside in. So we were able to kind of grow in a, in a donut or an annulus shape. And uh, that allowed us to massively raise the size of the vessels we were growing in. Um, so, I mean, our largest, I think, was um, a 240 liter wheelie bin with a with 125 kgs of substrate, which you know, is a bit unmanageable, but it was impressive that it actually did fruit and was successful. So on the right, you can see um, some of our blue barrels and wheelie bins there as well, fruiting. And uh, on the bottom left, you can see the, the, the amount of experiments. So each one of these would have been a batch. So 10 liter buckets, we did 76 of them. Uh, late lac tube and column bag, we did 285 of them. And 140 liter wheelie bins, which was our ultimate design that we settled on, we did 103 of them, eight 240 liters, and et cetera. Actually, one interesting, the, the 1100 liter wheelie bin, um, which is like a big dumpster. I'm still hopeful that I can get, I did one experiment where that just failed, but um, that would be interesting, I think, if you could, replicated on that mass scale. It's it's very little work to do to get quite a lot of, of mushrooms.
So yeah, just quickly on our chosen design, I guess, um, look, it's, it's very simple. You drill holes into this seven inch ESB pipe, you drill holes into the, this uh, wheelie bin and you stick the pipe in the center and fill the substrate around it. And yeah, you're able to get the air exchange from the outside in, inside out. Uh, and it's just, it reduces your, the manual element of the workload of mushroom, mushroom farming um, uh, substantially, we found, you know, compared to column bags or smaller vessels. There is actually, uh, like one major element with reusable vessels and if i just go back here to the column bags of they, they just get disposed with the reusable vessels you have to clean them uh you know to prepare for the next batch and that is laser intensive as well and there's no real getting away from it i mean with these when we're when we're finished with these bins we would just invert them tap them on the end and that would remove a lot of the substrate but a power hose is probably preferable and yeah like i said it's just with non-disposable growing vessels, there is that extra workload element. Okay, so on to work package one. Um, yeah, so it was full of sensors, mainly uh, for electrical usage, water usage, and environmental control. Um, so as I said before, we have these different stages like incubation and fruiting, and we want to um, control the environments in, in these rooms. So we use a suite of sensors co called UbiBot, which uh, actually, to be honest, kind of <laughs> took the game way ahead in, in your at-home sensor. Previously, it was a company, I forget exactly, but they, they just weren't on the same, same scale at all. Like with UbiBot, you can literally very easily uh, program some environmental rules, monitor in real time, get alerts, uh, export the auto sync the data to Google Sheets so it's always uploaded and uh, to the cloud. And um, yeah, so it's best illustrated with an example. So. Let's take the fruiting room where we want to keep the temperature above 12 degrees Celsius and the humidity above 80% and the CO2 below 600 parts per million. Then we set a number of rules within the UbiBot console. So rule one would set the tr tr CO2 thresholds at 600 parts per million and 450 parts per million. And whenever the CO2 rose above 600, the large fan would turn on in the antechamber and flush uh, fresh air in and this will drop the CO2. And similarly for humidity, whenever the humidity drops a, a certain amount, then the humidifier would turn on, raise the humidity until it reached a certain level and then turn off when it, it, it fit that level. So very simple, uh, but I mean, incredibly effective. Really, we are completely automated in terms of environmental control. You'd have to debug, like uh, some issues would arise sometime. Maybe you'd get a lapse in connection or something like that, but it's pretty rare. So uh, kind of impressive how much you could automate the environmental control. Yeah, what we're looking at here is the seal, the, the environmental control parameters in, in the fruiting room over one day, the 7th of December. So on the left axis here, we have temperature and relative humidity, so a 0 to 100 scale. Um, and if we look at the temperature here, the red line, fruiting temp, it's around 15 degrees the whole day. And this is 7th of December, our antechambers probably kept at 20 degrees, so it's, that's reasonable. It's, it's, it's good enough for the depths of winter. Um, and we can see that here we have a good example of the oscillating nature of our of our relative humidity. So uh, humidity is low, the humidifier turns on, gets to 95, turns off. So you can see the probably the upper threshold is 95 here. And so for CO2, this this purple line, then we move over to the right hand side axis where we can CO2 we can see CO2 parts per million. And again, we just have this oscillating nature. So we um, want to get it where it never goes above or what's that 650 so yeah yeah you don't want it going above 650 and when it gets to four, down to 450 is when i realize i can't really drop it anymore you can't get fresher and um, so i the, the fan would turn off so similarly for incubation it's a very similar chart except um you can see that the the, the turquoise the relative humidity is not at 95 it's 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 lower uh, our temperature is a bit lower and our co2 if we go over to the right hand side axis here we can see our co2 is much higher at, at about um yeah, over a thousand, twelve hundred, between twelve hundred and eight hundred parts per million. Uh, remembering that outside air is uh, around four, four fifty, and um, yeah, we're looking to keep it above eight hundred for that period of incubation. So yeah, then I guess additionally we had uh, soil sensors in within the bins within the substrate. That's actually probably a, a, a picture to show you what the uh, the middle top right when we have the fully incubated bin and. Um, a soil sensor is placed inside. You can see the central air column as well. And yeah, this was just useful as well to identify if we were running different experiments um, to see, yeah, to actually kind of have a bit more idea of what's going on. 
So our, the chart we here have here down the bottom left is essentially um, a big pipe versus small pipe test. So you want to essentially, you want to minimize the, the size of the internal pipe so you maximize the amount of substrate so you maximize your potential yield. We also want to, if the pipe is too small, then you have no internal aeration. So what's the trade-off here, you know? Uh, so we trialed two things, which was a seven inch pipe versus a four inch pipe. Um, same identical mix, identical bin, just one out of seven inch pipe, one out of four inch pipe. And if you look at the red and yellow lines, the, the or, or yeah, red and orange, the orange is um, the big pipe temperature and the red is the small pipe temperature. So in this instance, the small pipe temperature, you can see raised considerably higher. It's about eight degrees higher there. Um, Celsius than 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 the big pipe, so it, it, it breached about the, thir the thirty two um, the thirty two degrees Celsius, and the higher you go, then you, you encounter more risk of contamination with trichoderma or green mold, like I mentioned earlier. Uh, we can also see if we if we compare the green. So again, uh, it's maybe a bit confusing, but worth noting that temperature and hydration are on the same left hand side axis here. Um, it's it's applicable for both. So. Uh, the green and, and blue lines, we can see that the blue line is the small pipe hydration and the green line is the big pipe hydration. So the hydration in the big pipe uh, was maintained at a higher level for longer. And you really, it indicates that there's a lot of evaporation with the small pipe as it was heating up, losing water. And that loss of water is will reduce your overall yield in the long term. So on the basis of, of information like this, we were able to go with the small pipe or the big pipe. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. So then just a, a quick look, I guess, before we uh, get into some charts about the manually collected data we had. So the, the environmental sensor data, and I'll get to electrical consumption data in a bit, that was all um, um, automatically connected and collected and just exported to, to the cloud. For our manually collected data, we had uh, yeah three, two main categories really that we updated and then water. So our recipe data and our harvest data and our water usage data. So the top, uh, chart or little table we can see the recipe data so we're logging the vessel type uh, the color just for the crack <laughs> I reckon uh, then the experiment description um, uh, the mix date the strain and then the kg is the coffee calcium carbonate what wood shavings water spawn chaff which is also a kind of a coffee husk um, a byproduct uh, straw and um, yeah for our harvest data then the the where it was harvested uh, the day it was harvested and the amount that was harvested in uh, iteration so mo mushrooms kind of produce a number of flushes uh, you know a number of harvests which are called flushes so your first harvest is flush one then you, you wait a bit longer it'll re uh, regenerate and uh, and you'll get a second um, harvest known as flush two and then our water usage data. So that uh, 750 liter rainwater collection tank you saw at the back of the container that had a flow meter on it. So it was very just simple analog flow meter that would measure the amount of water flowing through it when it was flowing. So anytime our humidifier would turn on, start pulling water from that rainwater, or we'd use it in a mix, uh, water would flow and it would turn a little cog that would then um, increment so we could I have an idea as long as we went and checked the, the water and logged it, we would have an idea of how much water we were using per week or whatever interval. So yeah, so this chart then is uh, on the kind of, we, we logged how much coffee we were collecting and how much mushrooms we were producing. So on the top, we can see a monthly um, chart. So the brown line is how much coffee we were collecting per month from February 21 to April 23. Uh, and the green line is the amount of mushrooms we were producing. Um, so yeah, a total of 3.7 tons of coffee collected uh, in that two-year period or two plus, and um, and a, a, just over a ton of of, of mushrooms produced. Um, so the bottom chart as well, we can see just a, it's the same chart as above, but it's just broken up into weekly segments. Um, and yeah, we can see that you know large collections of coffee weren't always followed by large amounts of mushrooms produced due to failed harvest or just collecting coffee that was beyond our capacity to produce so it is a like there's just such an abundance of coffee in dublin that um you, you, yeah we often ended up with a huge amount that we couldn't possibly process okay so yeah slightly maybe comp a little bit complicated at first but uh what we're looking at is a stack column chart so 
for our recipes. So basically, the the chart represents from left to right. Each 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 line represents a mix, and then we're looking at the percentage of each ingredient in that mix. So um, yeah, for instance, the first one is around forty percent brown, forty percent coffee. Then it's another thirty percent wood shavings and waters X percent, and so on. So it gives us an idea of how our our recipe composition composition changed over time and you know, you could tie this with the data for harvest as well, or you should really, and um, identify which recipes are, are performing the best and giving you the best percentage yields, let's say, which is essentially what we were doing, uh, maybe not fully analytically all the time, but but just kind of eyeballing it and saying this is working. Um, so, yeah, so then at the very top, we just have some yeah figures for, the, for this time period from February 21 to April 23. Yeah, average percentage coffee was actually 49%. I mean, at the beginning, we were trialing coffee, pure coffee mixes, you know, just like 100% coffee uh, waste products, no carbon in the sense of wood shavings being added. And it works, like, but it's just, it was found it pretty inconsistent a lot of the time. So the wood shavings definitely improved things. And I'm, I say that for the most recent six months of data, we can see that our recipe became somewhat settled at 30% coffee, 30% water. 25% wood shavings, 14% spawn, and 1% calcium carbonate, which is uh, just added to reduce the acidity of the coffee. Um, so yeah, how much mushrooms did we produce and how, what was the percentage yield? Um, so we saw the total amount of mushrooms was just over a ton, but this chart, we zoom in on a, a smaller subset of, of, of uh, the data. And uh, kind of, so what we're looking at here is 445 to 465. It's, they're, they're, they're wheelie bins. Uh, each, each column represents a different batch, a different wheelie bin. So if we look at 465 is the one I think are, I think are 448. Um, I'll just, yeah. So if we look at vessel 448 in particular, we, I say at the base there, we can see our first harvest was, it was 5.5 kgs. Our second harvest was 4.2 kgs. Our third was 2.4, 1.8, 1.8. So that's how you kind of interpret this chart. Each, each different color represents a different flush. Uh, the blue line that's ranging from 15 up to 42 and then back to 27. For this, we read off the right-hand side axis and this is our total percentage yield. So what I'm saying here is that if we did a mix of 50 kgs of substrate and we got 5 kgs of mushrooms out of that, that would represent a 10% yield. So the 42% here is, is, is anomalous, like that is a great yield. Um, and, you know, it was a small, a, um, like a small time mushroom farm benchmark would probably be around a 20%, uh, ideally a little bit plus of that would be what you'd be aiming for probably within two flushes though i'd say whereas we really um you know extended the amount of flushes we got from some of these bins and i think that you know in time we realized that really we were opening ourselves up to more contamination for diminishing returns so probably two flushes max three would be enough to before you you'd remove the bin and you know begin a composting process okay so <clears throat> yeah i guess this is just the same chart as above, but you know, because we're doing it over, we have two years really where the data, it, it's quite substantial. And um, yeah, I'm just showing here, I guess you can see the jump that occurs uh, when we convert from these small yields here, and then we, we, we convert to wheelie bins, uh, the amount of yield we're getting per, per, per vessel, you know, um, wheelie bin or column bag jumps sub, sub, significantly. I mean, the percentage yield stays the same or similar, but uh, yeah, just the amount we get per batch um, uh, jumps significantly. Oh yeah, so, uh, well, I'll get to this later, but you know, uh, I'm just mentioning this kind of 240 liter wheelie bin that produced 30 kgs of mushrooms. It's a 28% yield. A lot of these on the chart, there's no environmental control. Um, so while we were constructing the container, um, we didn't have uh, any electricity and we were growing mushrooms inside. It's essentially outdoor conditions are very similar and I'll get to it later, but it just is interesting that, uh, that, that the, what you can get with zero environmental control, just utilizing the fact that Ireland is actually outdoor environmental con conditions are perfect for growing mushrooms a, lot, a, a large span of the year. Okay, uh, so how long did it take you to produce these mushrooms? So again, it's a similar chart to before. We're looking at each column represents a different wheelie bin, and we can see that uh, 
the bottom chart, the bottom bar is 17 days, let's say on this 17 days in incubation, 16 days to first flush, 29 days to, to second flush, 43 days to third flush. Um, so yeah, it's just a way of us tracking, you know, how, how are we sticking to our schedule? The three week schedule of incubation is like pretty, pretty bang on. We're, we're happy enough with that, but really we were missing the five week and seven week first week, first flush and second flush uh, targets that, you know, a lot of farms would have. I think this may be down to our non-pasteurization approach, which I'll mention shortly, uh, or this probably could be a factor, um, but you'd need to do more testing to identify that. And how do we utilize this data? So. So we're looking at this table here and we can see that the top is a low spawn versus high spawn. So we have a row where we can see, okay, we got 27% yield versus 32.9% yield um, and the spawn of 16.4 versus 18.7. So on the basis of that, I guess you'd weigh up the cost of the increase in spawn versus the cost that you're hopefully generating from the sale of the increase in mushrooms and be able to determine if the more spawn is, is better. And you can see a, a number of different experiments um hydration tests oak versus pine so substrate indoor versus outdoor so as i just explained like you know growing mushrooms completely outdoors versus growing them indoors with environmental control what's the difference in yield that you that you achieve and what's the difference in electrical consumption costs so yeah quick note in pasteurization um there's a lot of text here i kind of felt like that maybe people you know i felt like yeah it's, it's an important point for us is that one of our biggest differences between our farm and the other farms our other farms is a complete abandonment of pasteurization really just because of we were getting um you know like good enough yields without any pasteurization and it's a significant extra step in the preparation of your substrate to actually have to heat everything to 70 degrees plus or pressure cooker or cold wine um pasteurization so yeah just the fact that we uh, were getting significant yields uh, without pasteurization we never really uh, revisited even though some of our early experiments you can see that whoops um our non-pasteurized straw returned an average of nine percent yield with a first flush after 31 days whereas pasteurized returned an 18 percent yield after 26 days so it would indicate those early experiments some benefits from pasteurization um for sure but uh, yeah it's just significant extra labor input so our what about our water requirements um well here we can see the the large water rainwater collection surface the small one they both fed into this 750 liter water tank with the flow meter here um and yeah so we essentially i estimated the the amount of rainwater this collect by taking 10 years of historical rain data for for marion street and averaging it so we get like an average over how many at the last 10 years how much rainfall falls in each month and what we're able to see here then is a chart where the turquoise or the light blue represents the amount of liters collected by our rainwater collection surface and the dark blue represents the amount of liters used by our farm um from one year june 2022 to june 23. So yeah, massively over uh, over engineered. We didn't need uh, the the capacity we 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 designed at all. Uh, we end up using far less water than we could actually collect, uh, or that we were collecting. Whoops, sorry. So in this chart, I have just compared to a smaller rainwater collection surface. Just uh, sorry, I know I'm going fast here, but it is uh, four minutes. So this this small one at the base here, it's only 2.3 by 2.4. So essentially removing the effect of this 6.1 by 2.75 larger surface. Um, and you can see that even that smaller one should account for our, 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 our water usage needs for uh, most of the year, except I think here in April, where we would have collected less than we used. So farm electricity requirements, um, yeah. It, we logged, we had eight, nine different circuits all monitoring how much electricity each thing was using. So whether it was the anteroom fridge sockets, the anteroom door sockets, the ones supplying the fans and the, uh, the AC unit, obviously. Uh, and what came out of that is that this is a one year, the AC unit's like 38% of the, the the energy and the fans in, in, in the antechamber pushing into air into incubation and fruiting are another 30%. So, I mean, this is this chart is kind of useful as a time series data for us. So we're looking at uh, stack column charts again over a year. Uh, and it's just again showing what we saw previously in that the dark blue and the light blue account for the vast amount of the energy. Uh, and it's just charted here on a daily basis so we can see how much energy is being used today. It might be useful in terms of identifying how much, um, what kind of renewable capacity structure or, or, or system you need to satisfy this daily need. Yeah, theoretical versus actual usage. Can the farm satisfy, um, can solar panels satisfy the actual usage? So what I did was I modeled the amount of uh, uh, 
energy that solar 35 meters squared, so our entire surface of our roof would collect over the course of the year, and then looked at our actual energy uses over the course of the year. So the blue is just how much would 35 meters square of solar panels collect using SEAI data and weather data. Um, over the course of the year, and the red is how much we actually use. You can see that we only use more in November, December, those cold months. So maybe you could supplement with, with um, wind energy. So yeah, onto work package two, our coffee-based substrate composting. We did three tests, uh, open bottle, very simple, just uh, you know, stuck a, <laughs> similar to our large bin, just left the dispensed substrate in there exposed. Vermicomposting, where we built this 300 liter uh, continuous flow through worm bin, and then this Thermo King, which is a purchased off the shelf uh, composting solution. So this middle one, this continuous flow through worm bin, we added our own uh, red wigger worms. And there's a, we measured pH, organic material, uh, matter, nitrogen, potassium, phosphorus, lime requirement. There's a look at inside the things and here's the output. So we can see that the vermicomposting basically comes out on top. Uh, it's the most uh, well-balanced attributes and um, it would be most suitable for the largest variety of plants. And then we can see some strawberries that were growing on our spent compost, on our spent substrate outside the shipping container. So just a cardboard substrate test then. Uh, we, yeah, looked at growing off cardboard. We used some shredded cardboard and um, did a test of smaller shreds versus larger shreds. Both colonized, smaller shreds slightly better. Um, so cardboard can be used, but we noticed that like some inconsistencies in the supply in terms of tape and ink um, being on the cardboard that could cause issues. Quick note on biocomposites, won't read the text, but it's just cool maybe to see these uh, molds of droids or uh, Vader or something that we put substrate in uh, and inoculated it and then uh, heated it in the oven and they produced those molds. So uh, overall thoughts and learnings, um, water and electrical is possible, like water clearly is, Pasteurization would probably give a larger water requirement, but um, electrical is also possible, particularly if you sacrifice AC. I mean, you know, it's definitely possible then, really. Should be noted that a heat exchanger, so the fact that we're cooling the incubation room because the bins are, the, the mushrooms produce so much heat during, during incubation, and then cooling the, uh, the, the our, our, and then heating the, the fruiting room means that maybe if you had a simple heat exchanger running between incubation and, and fruiting, that might be an effective and efficient way of, uh, heating and cooling boat. So the lot, uh, yeah, so overall viability and replicability. I mean, yeah, just growing your main ingredient for your own product uh, is just, it really hampers your, your ability to scale. So i give a good example, like a, a delicious gourmet peanut butter sells for approximately seven euro. Our jar was selling for 850. If they want to double their orders, uh, for next month or whatever, they'd order twice as much peanuts, twice as much spices, twice as much kitchen, kitchen time labor, etc. But the crucial difference for us is we have to collect twice as many coffee grounds, grow twice as many mushrooms with twice as much in farm space, environmental control, risk of contamination still there. So it's just, uh, yeah, we encounter these difficulties when you're when you're growing your own your own um, ingredients. Now, there are definitely examples of uh, successful small scale farms, such as Growth Cycle and Rotterdam in Holland, uh, Rotterdam in particular, using our approach. But you do notice that they definitely rely our, you know, their alternative revenue streams outside of directly the mushrooms themselves are very important to their viability. Um, Okay, so yeah, real quickly, I know I'm over time here, but I think this is important, uh, or at least kind of close to my heart as I feel this to maybe the biggest application of our approach is that this potential for plant and mushroom synergy. So the fact that we were able to do like 480 something experiments with no pasteurization and like, yeah, definitely some failures, but like a lot of consistency and success as well. Um, I think that there's a lot of potential for DIY mushroom farming that's not really, because it's, it's seen as maybe somewhat complicated and you have to do pasteurization. I mean, if we look at the, the shipping container on our right, they, they were just mushrooms left in there in wheelie bins, no environmental control, no nothing. You will get a harvest. And we're there 32 degrees Celsius while they're incubating and they're pumping out uh, quite a bit of CO2 as well. So if you place them within a, a greenhouse scenario, they'd add heat to the greenhouse while also providing CO2 for plant enrichment. Um, yeah, so I just have a thing that the, the bins that were, oops, sorry, the bins that were left outdoor, outdoors yield 73% of the mushrooms produced by the indoor counterparts, and they had none of the associated electrical usage. So yeah, it's just it's just an interesting thing that I want to test going forward is looking at plant uh, growth within a, a let's say a, a poly house or polytunnel or something with a mushroom bin versus not, and see if see what differences are. Uh, so definitely, this slide is the most important; has to be included. Um, 
EPA is saying that where spent coffee grounds are sourced from commercial premises for use as a growth medium, byproduct or end of waste regulatory requirements may apply. And then questions, if the, that slide should leave us on anyway. Thank you.